I am Lauren Ross Diedrichsen, Colonel, USA, retired. I got a Bachelor of Science degree and then the Air Force sent me to the Stanford Business School to study management and then promptly assigned me to Washington, D.C. and I served in the Chief of Staff's office shortly for orientation and then they put me into the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission where I became responsible for maintaining the inventory of the uh, accountability of the nuclear weapons stockpile and involved in the security and the, you might say, auditing the manufacturing facilities and the storage facilities for all the nuclear weapons in the U.S. And I was there, while I was there, I had my first incident with UFOs, which in mid-July they flew over Washington, D.C., and I saw my first nine UFOs. <laughs> It is July of 1952. Of course, during that period of time, I made a lot of contacts. I was a staff officer for the military liaison uh, committee between the chairman of the AEC and the secretary of defense. And so I became acquainted with not only the Army, Navy, and Air Force, but civilian agencies, the CIA, the National Security Agency, and other contacts which I developed. Uh, during that period of time, one of my functions was to uh, accompany a security team which visited all of the nuclear facilities to check on the security of weapons. And we were getting reports of visits by UFOs over the storage facilities and even some of the manufacturing facilities. And that went on continuously. Now, <clears throat> we found that the reports uh, the formal reports were few and far between, but the security people were reluctant to report many of them because the protocol and the bureaucracy involved in, the, in reporting them, they just avoided reporting. Later, I was assigned to the Sandia Corporation as a military liaison, and uh, I was involved in establishing the quality assurance program for the manufacture and the quality and the maintenance of the nuclear weapons. So we had to visit all of the manufacturing facilities, uh, such as the Rocky Flats uh, and the Pantex facility, which assembled the nuclear and non-nuclear components of the weapons. And so there again, we observed the UFOs were very much interested in the facilities that we were visiting. But we did get constant referrals to, what are all these UFOs hanging around here for? And so, um, then after that siege, this was during the 50s to the entire 50s, then I was assigned to the Unified Pacific Command under Admiral Felt during the 60s, and I was the officer in charge of the alternate command post involved in nuclear weapon operation planning. And um, during that period of time, I was uh, maintained contacts with NORAD, with the SAC operations involved in the single integrated operational plans for the use of nuclear weapons. And during this period of time, I also in learned of a number of incidents which happened. And uh, then further on, I re finally retired from the Air Force and uh, joined the Boeing Company, where I was assigned to the Minuteman program where I was responsible for the configuration accounting of all the nuclear fleet of Minuteman 1, 2, and 3. And uh, during that period of time, I also learned about incidents involving nuclear weapons. And among these incidents were a couple of nuclear weapons sent into space were destroyed by the extraterrestrials. In talking to various contacts throughout, they would allude to the fact that these did happen. There was, for example, the, the missile, Minuteman missile, which destroyed the launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base. That's now a public matter of record. The one incident, for example, was they, they actually photographed the uh, UFO following the missile as it climbed into space and shining a beam on it, which uh, neutralized the, v uh, the missile. 
and this was recorded. It was all hushed up, and they split up the team to observe it, but of course eventually the, the news came out, and it was later published and confirmed it. In fact, they, they were taken so seriously that the reporters re would often not report them because it involved so much bureaucracy and protocol and etc. They deliberately would not report them. Almost, almost cases where the uh, uh, UFOs became identified, at least on a radar or with reports why they would try to scramble uh, aircraft to intercept them. Uh, it was a very aggressive, uh, you might say, response from uh, our own government. And that is their major concern, is to preserve the integrity of the Earth because it affects their own system. Well, there was one incident when uh, we exploded a nuclear weapon uh, over the Pacific, and this was in about 61, I believe. And the consternation that it caused because it shut out communications entirely over the Pacific Basin for a number of hours in which no radio transmission was available at any time. And this was very significant, and of course, this was one of the things that the extraterrestrials later, I learned, were highly concerned about because it affected our ionosphere. And in fact, spacecraft were unable to operate because of the pollution in the magnetic field of which they depended upon. The very end of the 70s or the early 80s, we attempted to put a nuclear weapon on the moon and explode it for scientific measurements and other things which was not acceptable to the extraterrestrials. And what happened? They destroyed the weapon before it got to the moon. With reference to the incident which our government sent a nuclear weapon for explosion on the moon's surface, it was tended to, as I understand it, to assess some scientific data and reaction and so forth. The idea of any explosion in space by any Earth government was not acceptable to the extraterrestrials, and that has been demonstrated over and over. And what's the consequence? How is that demonstrated? By the destruction of any nuclear weapon sent into space. That was at the time when I was assigned to the Atomic Energy Commission on Independence Avenue. And uh, uh, it just so happened that I was out that evening and and the incident occurred, and, and uh, looking up, I held my hand up, and they were bigger than my thumb over my head, over Washington. And it was very, they were very visible. And they, the second time they appeared over Washington, I did not see them that time. But of course, it caused a great flurry in the newspapers and a lot of excuses by the government officials and, and uh, rationale and so forth. I counted nine of the night that I saw them. They were around the, the typical disc uh, type aircraft, uh, spacecraft. But they were there, they were illuminated, they were quite visible. Their configuration was very conspicuous. They were not aircraft because I'm a, I have been a pilot for 20 years and I'm acquainted with what aircraft look like. Well, I was with the Atomic Energy Commission during the period of 51, 52, 53, and 54. And at that time, as I said, my, one of my functions was to visit all of the storage facilities throughout the United States for security purposes. To see that the, at that time, the custody of the nuclear components was in control of the civilians. And, of course, the non-nuclear components were under the custody of the military. So there was a split responsibility for the weapon custodial care. So our job was to audit the functions of both the military and the civilian. And while there, we encountered, constantly encountered these reports from security personnel who had to be out in the field around the igloos and the other storage facilities that at night time, particularly, these incidents would occur. In some cases, there were confirmations of radar. Yes, at the storage facilities particularly, because they were in or near military installations. Yes, that's true. 
shortly after I, I retired from the Air Force, um, and I still was maintaining contact with friends and associates at the various places, and on Colonel Parker and the Air Defense Command and the Space Command, particularly I would uh, run into him. He mentioned an incident which I later confirmed. A spacecraft went to the rescue of Apollo 13, and they accompanied Apollo 13 on their voyage around the moon and back to Earth. And on two occasions, they thought they might have to transfer the crew to their spacecraft, but they saw them safely back to the Earth. People were interested in the extraterrestrial technology, very much so. In fact, uh, uh, that was the time when Area 51 became notorious. Well, I guess there's more and more people like me that are getting along <laughs> in years that don't, don't, would like to re recall some of the incidents that they've encountered. And uh, it, it, the truth is going to come out sooner or later. Into the frame came something else. It flew into the frame like this, and it shot a beam of light at the warhead, which is represented by my thumb here. Now, remember, all this stuff is flying at several thousand miles an hour. So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, and then this thing flies up like this. Meanwhile, we're all going like this, fires another beam of light, goes around like this, we're going like this.